Senator Carrie Ann Eiffel is a trailblazer on many fronts. Whether she's presiding as president of the Senate. The sitting is resumed. Senator Ains, you have the floor. Teaching computer skills to the visually impaired or leading the worship service at her church, she takes it all in stride. Though she lost her sight at age five, she has never accepted that there was anything she couldn't accomplish. I just didn't understand why I had to be different, why I had to be excluded from things that other children, other young people got to enjoy. So I did not accept that they had to be, so I just did what I wanted to do. Um, I did ballroom dancing because I always wanted to learn to dance. I went horseback riding because I wanted to ride a horse. I learned to swim because I wanted to learn to swim. I didn't see why blindness needed to prevent me to from doing those things, so I did. The majority of her primary school years were spent here at the Irvin Wilson School. Before I went totally blind, I used to go to the, what was the Erdiston Model Mix School at the time. And after that, in a period of hospitalization, treatment overseas and all of that, I came back to Barbados and I went to school at the then School for the Deaf and Blind. Now it's called the Irvin Wilson School. And that's where I spent um, my primary school education. And that was an interesting experience because unlike other schools, we were only six children in the group. And we weren't all the same age, but we were schooled in the same room for the most part, two teachers. And so it was kind of more like a family than an actual class because you had older brothers and sisters, so to speak other children that were younger than you, that kind of thing. She transitioned into Combe Mare in 1987 through the sheer determination of one of her teachers at Irvin Wilson. I didn't do the common entrance in the conventional sense. I had a teacher. She is one of those people who didn't understand the reason why you couldn't. She felt that I should have been given the opportunity to do the common entrance. And the year that I should have done it, she waited until the exam was over and cajoled a copy of the exam <laughs> from somebody later in the year and told me to try it so that we could see if I was on par with children my age. And I did it and I did fairly decently, I think. But um, so we, you know, we used that as a, as a platform to say, hey, this child could succeed in regular school. But after a period of, you know, investigation and discussions and talks and what's not, it happened that I was interviewed by another reporter who found it interesting, the things I was talking about as a child. He was overhearing a conversation, and I was talking about playing video games and guitars and things like that. He thought that was interesting. So he did a newspaper article about it, and the then Minister of Youth Affairs um, saw it, and he was also of the opinion, well, this child should go to secondary school because that was one of the things I said I'd like to do visit a school for one day and so he said why one day you could do it you know why not just do it and through the intervention of the minister and the willingness of Combermere School and going on my academic performance they felt that I could succeed there and so that's how I got to go to Combermere. Her secondary school years represent a cherished period of her life. As I tell everybody I am a unrepentant Combermerian. I am proud to be a Combermerian. Not just because the school is a great school, but because of the wonderful experience of being there. Um, it sounds corny, but the first day I went to school at Combermere, I remember going into the hall, and I remember sitting there, and they announced that I was there, and the children cheered, and that was nice. But you know, it was the part that stuck out most in my memory that the song they chose that morning for the, from the Songs of Praise was Morning Has Broken. And as a blind person, when you go to church services and stuff, you don't always have access to the music because you, know, you don't have a Braille copy. So I didn't have a copy of the hymn book, but I knew every word to Morning Has Broken. And because they chose that hymn, they didn't choose it because of me, but from that minute, I knew I belonged there because they chose something I could sing with everybody else like any other student. As a student with a disability, there were challenges, but Senator Eiffel says everyone banded together to overcome them. The teachers, 
Some of them didn't know what to do with this blind child, but that was their first instant of panic. After that, they got into it, and when we had challenges, we talked about it, and we figured out how we were going to solve it. Uh, when we had to do the end of year exams, some of the other children felt that my typewriter would keep too much noise and be distracting during the exam. So we went off in a group, and we spoke to the deputy principal about it, and she said, okay, cool, and they organized so that I'd be invigilated separately from the student. So it wasn't always you know, teacher driven, it was all about us. They listened to us and they understood what we were talking about. And the experience was great. So I went through from Keiki to Gray and White and we just faced whatever challenges we had to face. To this day, Combermere remains an important part of her life. There's no such thing as a former or an old Combermere. You are a Combermerean, period. Uh, this year we had our global reunion in the United States and I was at the awards, I was at the dinner I went to the panel discussion. We, I visit the school from time to time. I have a good relationship with the principal. Some of my former teachers are still there. I talk to some of the pupils that go there. And some of my closest friends are the persons that I met when I was at school there. We talk on WhatsApp every day. We keep in touch. So Combermere is still a very big part of my life and will always be. From Combermere, it was on to the Cave Hill Campus, University of the West Indies, a decision that was not reached easily. I finished secondary school and I decided I had had enough of being the first, so I didn't want to do UE. So for two years I stayed at home, I fought it, I fought it, I fought it, I wanted to go somewhere else. But I don't always have the order of my life. God is a very big part of my life and he decides. And so I finally gave up fighting and I gave in and I applied and went to the University of the West Indies. And again, that was another great three years. So I don't regret that either. She does, however, regret her decision not to study law. It wasn't so much that I decided that I couldn't do it. It's that I was advised not to do it. And I don't blame the person that advised me not to do it. She advised me because she thought she was helping me to make to stave off uh, a disappointment down the line. What neither of us knew was that you can do just anything you want to do. It just means with a disability you may have to do it different, you may have to attack it from another angle, and you may have to put in more work than the other students, but it doesn't mean you couldn't do it. I'm sorry I didn't know that then, and yes, I deeply regret not doing law. I think I would have made a great lawyer, but that's life. I am where I'm supposed to be. Instead, she chose to study her second love, psychology, which prepared her for a career working with the disabled. I love to know what makes human beings tick, what goes on in your head. And so I did a degree in sociology and psychology, and then I did my master's with Durham Business School in business administration. I always think everybody should have some training in business. But um, I, at first, I didn't want to work in the field of disabilities. As a friend of mine said to me, just because you have a disability, it doesn't mean that's the only thing you can do. And I agreed with him at the time. But on the other hand, while I do firmly believe that because you have a disability, you don't have to work in disabilities, it's also the other truth that because I live with it, I know it. And so I went to work with the Barbados Council for the Disabled, and now I work with the National Disabilities Unit, and I love what I do because I know I make a difference, a direct difference. When you work in professional settings and stuff, you don't always get to see the results of your labor. When GIS puts out its programs, you don't get to know what impact it may have made on people's lives and differences. I don't have that problem. When one of my students that I teach now to use the computer comes in and tells me what he was able to do on the internet and where he's been able to go and what he's been able to learn and see, I know what difference I've made. So no, I don't regret it and I love what I do. A large part of her workday is spent in this computer lab at the National Disabilities Unit. The lab has been outfitted by Lime with the assistive technology used by the visually impaired. So we have two workers there, myself and my co-worker, Ms. Watson. She deals with the training of blind and visually impaired persons in the daily living skills, mobility and orientation. I work on the assistive technology as well as uh, Braille transcription. We both work with the assistive devices, distributing them and demonstrating them to 
persons in the community so that we can help people to see what they need to make their lives a little bit easier, a little bit different. Now, what may get confused when the development begins where it looks on spreadsheet? A workbook contains three spreadsheets by default. You can add or you can delete, but by default, each workbook has three spreadsheets. I teach students how to use the computer. I teach them how to use screen readers, screen magnifiers, how to access the internet, how to use the Microsoft suite of programs and other different programs as well. Basically, whatever they need in technology, I help them, I guide them, I advise persons on what they can do to make their facilities more accessible in terms of technology. Senator Eiffel says the impact of technology on the quality of life of persons with disabilities cannot be overstated. I always say that technology is a leveling experience. It's leveled the playing field for persons with disabilities in a way that nothing else has done. When I sit down with my computer and I email, Skype, do whatever I have to do, word processing, all of those things, my blindness is un unimportant. It's, it's not there. Once I have my screen access software, it doesn't make a difference. I can do a PowerPoint presentation like anybody else. That's what I try to share with other people. I, outside of the computers, there's technology all over the place. There's things that help you to read. There's cell phones that nowadays they're even coming with the built-in screen access software so that I can do anything I want with my cell phone. I dev um, the I devices from Apple, some of the Androids, all of them, they're coming with different features. And what I like about those is it allows persons who become disabled not to have to give it the quality of their lives. You may need to be retrained, you may need to learn how to do things differently, but you can still do your work. And that is what technology is able to do for persons with disabilities. How then did this very busy career woman make the transition into politics? I remember some years before um, I was appointed to the Senate. Somebody asked me if I ever thought of getting involved in politics, and I said, oh, me, never. And um, when, in 2008, the late Prime Minister Thompson asked me if I would serve in the Senate, he said he was uh, putting together his senators, and he, asked, he said he'd like to invite me to be one of them. I asked him if he's sure he was asking the right person, because I've never had any political training or experience. I saw it as an opportunity for persons with disabilities, not for me. I am a private person. I don't like the fact that my life is out there. Most people even know my age. But what it is, when I walk up the steps of Parliament, my blindness becomes secondary. I'm just another senator. When they understand that they need to have things in accessible formats for me, in Braille, it means that they start thinking about things that they didn't think about before. When I'm invited to go to meetings to speak on behalf of the Senate, to attend international conferences and those kinds of things, not only are people seeing my disability, but they're seeing me as their equal. That means that when they interact with another person with a disability, they think a little bit harder about it and they realize that this person has abilities their disability is secondary to them. It's, it's not the only thing to focus on. And that is what, that's the reason why I accepted the challenge. Because personally, I'm a private person, as I said, and I never thought about public life as my kind of thing. And then came her elevation in March 2012 to the post of President of the Senate on the retirement of Sir Branford Tate. She's the first woman to be appointed President of the Senate in Barbados the youngest person and the first person with a disability to hold the office. I remember when Sir Bramford um, retired, I teased, uh, I said to the Prime Minister, don't even think it, and he smiled. And uh, when he came, eventually he came to me and he says, you told me not to think it, I thought it, and I am so minded. <laughs> and I said, you sure, sir? And he said, yes. And um, so I took it up. And but. You know, to be honest, it does have its challenges, but again, it's just another one of those things that I've been asked to do, and I try to do everything to the best of my abilities. It's an interesting experience um, knowing 
what my responsibilities are. I take things in my stride. I try not to get overwhelmed by different things. Titles, titles really aren't that important to me. Positions aren't that essential. The fact that I have been asked to do them uh, means that somebody thinks I have the ability and so because of that trust, I try to do the best that I can. It means that I have a lot to do. It means a lot of responsibility. And some days I do feel completely overwhelmed by it all and the responsibility and the various factions and various people that are looking at me and watching. But I put that aside and I pull on my resources, not my only my internal resources, my spiritual resources, my family and my other supports, and I get the job done. It's uh, definitely a, a good training ground. I do enjoy the cut and thrust of debate. So I enjoy experiencing them, listening to them, um, being a part of what goes on, being a part of knowing that I can help to change what goes on in my country and things like that. So yes, it's very interesting. Senator Eiffel wants people to view her accomplishments as proof that anything is possible once you set your mind to it. I want them to see that you can do what you want to do, whether you're young, whether you're female, whether you have a disability, nobody has to limit you. The only limit is yourself. Yes, you'll encounter difficult attitudes from times and barriers that seem insurmountable, but if you want to overcome them, you can. You need support, you need assistance, you need help, yes, and sometimes you don't know where to get those things from, but you can do it. And I also would like people to see these accomplishments as steps going forward. We don't always get resolutions to everything we want. But to me, it is a beacon, it's a light. It's showing you that there, there are other places to go, yes, but at least we've gotten this far. After her address to Parliament on the occasion of the royal visit by Prince Edward, radio call-in programs were inundated with calls about how well she had done. She says she was surprised by the extent of commentary, but happy that people thought she had done well. First things first. I was a nervous wreck <laughs> um, because A, I'm meeting royalty, B, I have to read in front of these people, and C, I happen to be blind on top of all of that. So um, I worked on making sure things were coordinated. I practiced my curtsy for days, always, <laughs> really. But um, after that, and after the hue and cry, it was, I kept asking myself, why are these people so stunned? I've been, in, I, I've been to school. I've got two degrees, not just one. Why are people so shocked that, you know, I, I delivered the speech? And I didn't think it was so well done. I, I can still, every time I listen to it, I can hear at least two errors in it. And uh, those are the two things that stick out for me, the errors. But everybody else thinks it was so wonderfully done. But um, when I get past that part, I am glad that I was able to equip myself well in that setting. Too often I've heard people in various settings stumble, make mistakes, and I never like being an object of pity. Had I stumbled or made a mistake that day, people would not have been unkind about it. They would have said, she tried. Some people would have said, why did make her do that? They shouldn't have forced her to do those things. You know, they only set her up to look bad, those kinds of things. Nobody would have blamed me. They might have blamed a whole set of other people. But the fact that I did it and did it well, nobody was able to say those things. And they were able to say what a good decision, what a right choice she was, how well she delivered of herself. And that means that they will look at people like myself and think they can do this. That is what it meant to me. And much of what she does is powered by this resolve, to fight for the right of persons with disabilities to be seen first as people with all kinds of abilities. As president of the Barbados Council for the Disabled, she says there's much work to be done still in terms of changing perceptions. I'm satisfied that there, there are improvements. I'm satisfied that there, things are getting better. I'm satisfied about that. I'm not satisfied about where we are, though. I'm not satisfied that enough persons with disabilities are not employed. Um, I'm not satisfied that 
people with disabilities are still not just marginalized, but encouraged to stay segregated. People still say things like, uh, they go and park in the disabled parking, and when they're asked, well, why are you parking there? Oh, the disabled ain't got no right out at this hour of the night. I didn't think anybody would be here. Oh, I didn't know that they just come out, and those kinds of things. Those things are still very upsetting. I want to see when more persons with disabilities are going to school, are working, are out there, and, and the disability is, be is not the first thing you think about when you look at that person. When pity is not the first thing that you feel when you see a person with a disability. When dismissal isn't what they give to persons with disabilities. And I want people with disabilities in Barbados to recognize that you have a right Yes, you have a challenge. Yes, you may have a limitation in one area, but you don't need to focus on that. Focus on the other opportunities. I had a young lady call me um, recently. She's, she has a variety of different disabilities. And she, all she keeps saying to me is, I'm bored, Carrie. I don't want to stay home anymore. I want to do some things. I want to contribute. And she keeps thinking and thinking about the ways that she can do whatever little bit because she doesn't want to stay shut away anymore. That is what I want to see. And how does Senator Eiffel spend her free time? I'm very much involved with my church. I'm the Sunday School Superintendent. I sit on the church council. I'm the synod representative for the Church of the Resurrection. Um, so I'm very much involved in that aspect of my life. Other than that, I read a lot. I do crochet. I go to the beach. I do swimming classes. I used to do ballroom dancing. I keep threatening to go back, but I haven't found the time to do that as yet. Um, I hang out with my friends, and I just enjoy living. And what is on her bucket list as she looks to the future? I'd like to travel more. Um, I'd like to experience culture outside of Barbados some more. Um, you know, I'm a very contented person. I have most everything in my life that I need. I have good friends, a loving family. I have as much technology as I need to play with at the moment. I have my dogs. I have, I have God. I have what I need in my life. Um, I'm not married. I don't have children. If God wants those things, he'll bring those things for me. If he doesn't want those things, if they're not supposed to be part of my future, I have loads of godchildren and lots of children in my Sunday school, so I'm contented. Her Honor, Senator Kerry Ann Eiffel, President of the Senate in Barbados and a very accomplished Bajan.